All right, welcome back to part two of our mastery session. We are going to be starting today by talking about the alphabets that are built into the machine, as well as using the memory function in order to program in a name or other chain of decorative stitches. Your memory is controlled up here. Things to know about your memory. You have 30 available slots. The machine will remember one stitch per slot, and it will stitch one pattern from one slot, then move to the next memory slot and stitch that pattern. It endlessly cycles between the patterns that have been saved. So if you've saved three patterns or three letters, it will endlessly cycle between those three. Okay, so to get going with memory, we're going to press that mem button. Notice it has a little power icon that you might recognize from your laptop right next to it. Once I press that, the screen shows mem and it's blinking 30. That means that I have 30 slots left. Remember that there are a total of 30 available slots on this machine. This means I haven't programmed anything in. Okay, to select a slot, I've got right and left arrows and you'll notice I can go 30, Oh, well, since nothing's filled in yet, I can't cycle through empty slots, so it's just going to be blinking 30. Now, to enter a pattern, we simply need to type in the number of that pattern. We'll go back to our old friend, the tulip, number 25. And now from here, I've got one slot filled with stitch number 25, and then I can go to my next slot, which is slot number 29. To erase a slot, I simply go to that slot, number 25, and I press the clear button. And now I'm back to having a fully empty memory. To program in letters, we're going to access our lettering system, which is uh, noted by this A here. Now, because I have the 335, I have a couple different choices for fonts. I've got a block letter, and I've got an outline letter. I can tell because it cycles between two different little outline block, outline block options there. We'll stick with block for now. Okay, so there is an alphabet in here. There's also numbers and European characters and some symbols. I can cycle by using the right hand and left hand arrow keys to go through, and I can go backwards if I think that the number or something that I'm looking for is closer to the end of the alphabet, just like that. So we'll find the letter that we want. We'll just start with A because that's easy. And now we're going to enter it into memory. To enter it into memory, I am going to press the mem enter key right here. Okay, that's been entered. Now we're on slot number 29. I'm going to enter in a different letter. Again, I go back to my lettering. Now you have to be careful with this lettering. Every time I press this, it cycles to a different font, and so I have to double press it to get back to the same font I had before, which is block font. And I'll do B this time. Again, I press mem enter, enter into memory. This is the right hand arrow key, but it has a secondary function which is above it, and that's what I'm referring to. And finally, we'll do the letter C. I press A again. I notice that it's cycled to outline, so I press it one more time to get back to block. I find my letter C and I press mem enter. Okay, at this point I've got three letters in there and I'm going to show you how it's going to cycle through all three over and over and over. end this uh, at the end of the letters or the end of the word. You'll notice on screen it's showing me what it's stitching right now, so it's on B. So when it hits C, I'm going to use my pattern end button that we learned about before. <clears throat> and it force stopped, and sure enough I've got two little ABCs right there. Very sweet, very simple. But let's assume I made a mistake, that instead of A, B, C, I wanted to put A, G, C. How do I do that? Well, we're going to go back into our memory slot, so we can go A, B, C, and then cycle to 27. I'll go to B, 
and I will instead simply put in the G. And so now I've got A, G, C, okay? The cool thing about memory, it will remember this between turning the machine off and on again. And so this is here until you write over it or clear your memory. Obviously you can do decorative stitches, but most of us are interested in using our lettering in this way to put in a name. And so most of us are probably using our memory to put in a name. What if I don't use the memory? How does my lettering work? Well, if we turn our memory off, so again, I'm gonna be pushing that power button so that now I'm back into regular sewing mode, I can still access my alphabet, but it only stitches one letter at a time. This is gonna do a continuous chain of the letter A. There we go, A, A, A. All right, so that's a brief introduction to the memory and the lettering systems. From here, we're going to go on to the practical um, extras that come with your machine. We'll be talking about making a buttonhole and uh, doing some free motion very briefly. Okay, now we're moving on to buttonholes. This is one of the differences between the 325 and the 335 in that you have a different buttonhole foot and a very slightly different buttonhole system. If you have a 325, which is the more basic model, you're gonna have the number three foot, which is going to look a lot like your number one foot, except that it has an extra prong. Now, they are not interchangeable, even though they're very similar. What's important about the three foot is it's got room for a buttonhole to be stitched under there. That's where those beads are gonna sit. If you have a 335, you will have the 3A foot. The 3A foot will memorize the length of your buttonhole after you do one of them, and that's the benefit of this foot. We're going to do both. We're gonna start with the basic, which is the number three foot. And I've already selected my zero or 10 stitch, which is the basic buttonhole. On screen, you can see it's recommending the number three foot. We're almost at the maximum width of the buttonhole. We could go a little wider. We've got a moderate length, and it is showing us that the first thing to be stitched is going to be the left-hand bead of the buttonhole. Now, when you do a buttonhole with this manual basic buttonhole foot, you want to mark the placement of your buttonhole with an erasable tool, like a friction pen or a chalk pencil. You'll notice I've marked center line as well as a top and bottom line. Very important to mark those because we're gonna need to see when we're back at our starting and ending points in order to make this buttonhole um, look good and be effective. Okay, so this is going to stitch forward. We are going to put the needle down on center, right at the T at the top of that intersection where I had marked the middle and the top of the buttonhole. From here, we're gonna sew that forward bead. watching for when I reach that baseline that I had marked and I've just reached it, I push and release the reverse button. This is going to tell the machine to swap to the bar tack. Oh, actually no bar tack, it just swaps to basting backwards. And again, I'm watching for when I reach the top of the buttonhole, which is right about there. Hit reverse again. Now we do our top bar tack and our right hand bead. All right, and now that I'm back to my bottom 
uh, mark. I hit the reverse button one last time. Bottom bar tack. And it finishes it at four stops. So you can floor it right up until the end. And you can see what a nice buttonhole we've gotten there. So it's very simple actually to do this buttonhole. You just need to mark your start and end points and then um, hit that reverse button every time that you reach a start or an end point that you have marked. For cutting a, open a buttonhole, you can use a buttonhole cutter, which is like a razor blade. Uh, you can also use a seam ripper and just carefully cut up through there, being careful not to cut your stitching. Okay, the manual buttonhole foot is not actually that different than the fancy 3A foot. The effect is gonna be the same. We're still gonna to have to push the reverse button at one point, but the nice thing is we don't have to hit the reverse button as often, and once we've done one buttonhole, as long as we stay on the buttonhole stitch, it won't um, forget that buttonhole, and it'll just do the same size over and over. Okay, now there's a little bit of prep needed with this foot. You have a red line, in fact, I should take this back off. The prep for the foot, you have a red line right next to a zero right now. Now, this slider moves in that foot, but it's going to default to toward the back, and that's correct, you don't, you're not gonna fight that, you're gonna let it rest at its resting position, which is all the way back. This slider, is meant to show the extent of the buttonhole rather than you having to mark your fabric. So you start by measuring your button. Let's say that I have a button that's 13 millimeters long and you do measure in millimeters because this foot is marked in millimeters. So let's say I've got my 13 millimeter button, which is the same as a 1.3 centimeter button. The wisdom of buttonholes is you add two to three millimeters to the length of the button to get the length of the button hole. If it's a very thick button, you can add a little bit more. So for my 13 millimeter button, I'm going to put a 16 millimeter button hole and I line up that red triangle on the 16. Okay, now I can put my foot on. Oop, and I bump my slider. Okay, you still want to mark a starting point. I can just do a little crosshairs where the top of the buttonhole is going to go. That's the top center I'm marking and I lower my needle into that point. So as I stitch, instead of watching for a uh, marked line to show me the bottom of the buttonhole, I'm just watching for the little red line that's right next to the needle to line up with the red slider. Okay, there we go, we're even there. Now I'm going to push the reverse button face backward and forward. So the ease of this foot is that I don't have to continuously press the reverse button. Once I've logged the length of the buttonhole, it will remember where to stop and where to turn around. And then when I do successive buttonholes, I don't have to do anything. All right, so there's my nice 16 millimeter buttonhole. I'll do one more just to show you that it's going to be even easier the second time. I would mark a crosshairs for the top of my buttonhole, lower the needle. And I didn't have to do anything that time. Now, as soon as you leave the buttonhole stitch and come back, it will forget the length of that buttonhole, which is actually useful if you are fine tuning your buttonhole length and you realize that it's too short or it's too long, you can simply go to a different stitch and come back 
in order to reset the machine. It also will reset when you turn the machine on and off. Okay, so that's our buttonhole foot. They can get out of calibration, um, the communication here with that crystal. Uh, it is possible if you ever have a time where your machine won't stop sewing forwards, even though you've pushed the reverse button, it can need calibration and you can talk to your local technicians about that. Okay, next thing we're going to do is just a teensy bit of free motion in order to show you uh, how the feed dogs drop. Free motion is literally us driving the quilt. This is done as a top stitching technique. Um, we need a special foot for it. I've got the number 26 foot here. Oh, excuse me, I've got the number nine foot here, which is an option. There's also the number 26, uh, the 29. There's a bunch of different quilting feet out there, but the nine is the classic. Notice it's just a circle. It's not going to be um, squishing our fabric down toward the feet dogs, and so it doesn't need to be quite as beefy as, say, our number one foot. Okay, put this foot on, and then off to the right of your machine, underneath where your foot pedal plug is, there is a button that can get depressed, and it gets pushed in. You'll just take my word for it, right beneath the foot attachment, there's a button that can get depressed, and it's dropped my feed dogs. Okay. So, to free motion, you would need a quilt sandwich. And a quilt sandwich is just two layers of fabric and one layer of batten. So, I've got the world's tiniest quilt sandwich. And our last piece of prep is just going to be to go back to stitch number one, which is a straight stitch. You also usually change your needle size. Um, you go up to a size 90 or 100 when you're quilting, but for now, we won't bother swapping. I'm gonna do that same manual sewing trick I showed you before at the very beginning of the mastery, which is to manually sew a stitch and bring your bobbin thread up, except this time we're going all the way up through both layers of fabric. That's because when we quilt, we don't want that bobbin thre thread back there doing weird things without us knowing. Once we've brought our bobbin thread up, we go ahead and lower the needle back into the hole that we made before, and we lower our foot. So from here, the consistency of my stitch is going to be determined by the speed of the needle and the speed of, of using the quilt. So if I run the machine very slowly and I move my fabric relatively far for the time it takes the needle to go up and down, I'm gonna get a basting stitch, which is what I'm modeling right now. It's a little subtle, but they're nice long basting stitches. That would be useful if I'm just tacking my quilt together. If I sew very, very fast and I move my quilt relatively slowly, I'm going to get a very tiny stitch. And you may or may not be able to see that, but it's very short. I would guess that's like a one or 0.8 millimeter long stitch. Obviously the ideal is somewhere in between here. We are going to run our machine at a moderate speed and move our quilt at a moderate speed. And when we do this right, we can get a fairly normal, quote unquote, looking stitch length that's going to look in the ballpark of two millimeters to two and a half millimeters. Now, it can be a lot of variables, having to control both your hands and your foot. So remember, you are always welcome to run your machine with the start stop button, and you can narrow in on the right speed to run it at with the start stop button. And then that is a perfectly consistent speed and you just have to get used to moving your quilt around. And press to stop. Believe it or not, that is the basics of free motion. From here, it's a lot of practice and picking up tips and tricks, but all you have to do to get ready to free motion and start practicing is drop your feed dogs and put on the correct foot. Tension is sometimes something that you have to mess with. Remember how I said that your machine is optimized for two layers of quilting cotton? Once we add batting into the mix, that does change things, and so expect to have to mess with your tension a little bit. That's why you always do a practice sandwich um, made of the same batting and same fabric that you're gonna be using on your real project, and you do a little bit of sewing ahead of time so that you can iron out any sort of tension issues. Okay, to set back up for regular sewing, I'm going to depress 
the button I mentioned before that sits under where the foot control connects. I push it in and then it releases all the way back out so that it is flush with the body of a machine. They didn't clunk back up. The feed dogs, they clunk down when we disengage them, but they don't clunk back up when I re-engage them. And so people get worried that they haven't actually re-engaged their feed dogs. That's just because of how gravity works. Gravity doesn't fall upwards. All you have to do to get them to re-engage is start sewing and they'll make a little clunk noise and ta-da, they have come back up. All right, so from here, we are going to talk about cleaning and maintenance. That includes oiling, um, and also how you should get it regularly, professionally cleaned. All right, let's talk about cleaning and maintaining your Bernina. For this, we're gonna need some oil, a lint brush, and a Q-tip. So, for cleaning your machine, the only part you are responsible for is underneath the plate in the uh, feed dog and hook area. So we'll start this process by taking off the stitch plate. If you look at your stitch plate, there is a bullseye or crop circle looking icon in the upper right hand corner. If you push firmly on that symbol, and I do mean firmly, the plate should pop off. I'm going to go ahead and open up my bobbin door and take out the bobbin case as well. From here, I'm going to brush from the top down. And some of that lint is gonna fall down and so I can then get some in there. The nice thing about these big, cheap paint brushes is they're pretty grabby as well as brushy and so really I'm usually retrieving lint and then picking it off the ends of the brush. Q-tip, also a great tool for grabbing specific lint little bunches. Okay, now you're gonna brush like this, say every couple of small projects or every big project. You're also going to want to oil your machine. Oiling is very simple. You're gonna turn your hand wheel and I want you to see that as the machine is turning the hook, you can see a flat metal um, surface traveling past your field of view. There it's thinning out, there's the hook, you can see there's no surface right there now, and then it's gonna swing back, there's the hook, and then there's this long flat metal surface that's rotating past our eyes, and then there's the end of it. We're gonna put a drop of oil on that flat metal surface that rides in a track called the hook race, and it's metal on metal. So I'm just gonna put a drop of oil on that flat metal surface, and then I will turn my hand wheel towards myself to work that in. We always turn the hand wheel towards ourselves as much as possible. To turn it away from you is to turn the machine backwards, and they don't like to do that. It's okay to turn backwards a half a turn, let's say, when you're threading your needle to bring your needle all the way up, but you don't want to continuously turn the hand wheel backwards or away from you. Okay, so that is the easiest way to clean an oil but it's not always sufficient. Sometimes you've got thread stuck way down in there, your machine's getting really noisy, um, your machine might be locked up, it has so much thread, and so there is more disassembly and more cleaning that we can do. Okay, I'm gonna tip the machine back for ease of seeing. I want you to notice that you've got a gray U of metal down here at the bottom, and it has a little latch connected to it off to the left. If I push that latch to the left, the gray U can be brought forward and a black circle of plastic also comes with it. I've now revealed my hook and I can grab the center pin and take the entire hook out. From here, we're gonna do a little bit more thorough cleaning. The three series machines get very loud and they're usually loud because we get grit stuck in the hook race, which is the flat level, I'm gonna see if I can point to it, right here, not the inner, not the upper and inner flat level part, but the outer one, and that's what that hook race rests on. So, my handy dandy trick to keeping your machine quiet is to put some oil on the end of a Q-tip, and then wipe 
the Q-tip along the hook race, making sure to get all the way up. And then you'll notice that there is a permanent part of that hook system that is installed, but it does rotate. And so I rotate it to the other side so that I can then clean the other side of the hook race. Sometimes you even need a pointy tool like a stiletto to actually get some grit out of that very inside groove. But this one's actually pretty clean. Okay, once I've done that, I'm gonna put the hook back in. This is the one part that takes some practice. First thing I do is I bring my needle all the way up. Basically, that'll get my hook in an easy to place position. Notice that the permanent part of this system, little half moon there, is occupying half of a circle. This is the other half. I hold on to the pin and I lay this in there so that it completes the circle. It even overlaps a tiny bit right where the hook is. Now I'll know I've done it correctly because the edge sits flush with the outside right here. It does wiggle. It, this doesn't click into place like a puzzle piece, but it lays nicely. Next thing I do is I put the restraint up and I push on it until it pops fully behind this latch. Now, if I hear a really weird noise or it's really hard to push that restraint back up, it usually means that the hook is not in the right position. So that's another check for you. The final check is can I manually sew a stitch? Now, if you hear a weird noise like that, it usually means it wasn't in the right way. And so we'll double check ourselves. It looks like it worked its way in. And now we're gonna go all the way down and all the way up. It wasn't difficult to turn my hand wheel. I didn't hear any weird noises and I didn't hit anything. That means that I did get that hook back in there correctly. You definitely wanna do this check you want to be going zero miles per hour if you're going to hit something and not full speed running the machine. Okay. At this point, we've completed our cleaning and oiling. We're going to put our plate back on by putting the left side in and then pushing on the right side to pop it back into place. And then we are good to put our bobbin piece back in and shut back up. One thing to mention is that I have had a few people with machines with a latch that eventually got bent farther to the left than normal. And what that meant was they didn't get a good secure latching and the cage would pop down while they're sewing and pop the hook out, which is very scary. What you can do in that case is just drop the restraint and push that metal latch a little to the right. We're essentially bending it a little bit back towards the right. And then it'll form a really nice tight connection with that latch. All right, so that is cleaning and maintenance for us. There are a few extra accessories that you can get with this machine. There is a knee lift for the 335 only that you can purchase. There are tons of extra feet. There are walking feet. Um, for uh, questions like that, please feel free to contact us and sort of get information on your options and what those might do for you. But uh, in this mastery, we've basically covered the entire basic operation of the machine, a little bit of decorative options and getting to know your decorative variants that you have. We've covered the alphabet and making chains of letters or chains of decorative stitches. And we've also played with a few feet and talked about cleaning and maintenance. The last thing for you to keep in mind is that you should get your machine professionally cleaned and serviced once every couple of years. If you use your machine a ton in a year, if you basically every day for a couple hours are sewing on your machine, you should get it serviced at the year mark. But if you use your machine a couple times a week on the weekends, um, maybe very hard close to Christmas and then very lightly the rest of the year, you can go to the every two to three year schedule just fine but a professional service will get all the covers off, all the old grease and oil will come out, they'll put new oil and grease on, they'll check a variety of adjustments, check your tensions, uh, and it just helps prolong the life of the machine. We thank you for your attention at our mastery and we look forward to seeing you in our store.